Hello, and welcome to the Queer Monkey Institute, our Q&A conversation for exploration series. I'm Paul Robert, the Executive Director and President of the Institute, and along with my wife, Laura Lee, the Director of Research, Education and Outreach, and of course, on behalf of our Board of Directors, our advisors, our volunteers, and our supporting members, we want to thank you for joining us today. Uh, the Queer Among Institute is an independent, nonprofit research organization committed to researching consciousness and the human experience, following the footsteps of our founder, anthropologist Dr. Felicitas Goodman. And as an educational institution, we take an open approach and we invite scholars in related fields to help broaden the scope of our own work and exploration. That is why we call it Conversation for Exploration. And on these weekly Sunday discussions, we've had a full spectrum of topics, neuroscience, anthropology, archaeology, uh, ecology, philosophy, uh, mythology, shamanism, hero's journey, roots of theater. It goes on and on and on from the arts to the sciences and everything in between. You're welcome to visit our website at queermongainstitute.com. All of our presentations are free, and as a nonprofit, of course, we invite you to become a supporting member, and we want to thank you, the community members who continue to support the mission of the Queer Monger Institute. Today, let's go back in time. Let's visit our ancestral cousins, the, the, the Neanderthals. That was harder to say than it needed to be. Neanderthals were humans like us, but they were a distinct species. They left Africa long before our branch of our family did, and uh, they had their own long evolutionary spell in Europe and in Asia. So that's where we all came together and arrived uh, through new techniques and studies in archaeology, anthropology, psychology, and DNA sequencing. The best known of our ancestral cousins is getting a makeover. No longer yeah. can we look at them as, as some kind of primitive caveman or cave person in today's world of sensitivity to <laughs> gender. <laughs> but uh, as intelligence and accomplishments, they built uh, what structures, they, they use feathers and ornamentation to bury their dead. They made jewelry. They made jewelry with tools, that's right. So they were pretty sophisticated, the way that they conducted themselves, and also the way that they gathered together as family groups. Hey, they survived. There's yeah. even evidence, I, I, latest research I was reading online about, uh, they had health care. They, they, they really looked Took out for each other. other. Yeah. yeah, we could always use more health care. So our guest today will share what they've uncovered about the lifestyles of these early humans, their distinct characteristics, and what they were like. Well, this is such an important topic because to truly understand ourselves, we must ask, who are we? And in part, that answer lies in, where did we come from? And we've examined that question in many, many contexts, but today we'll look at the larger scope of our evolution and our family tree, all those long gone cousins, what happened to them? Mm -hmm. They were, uh, the Neanderthal were kissing cousins. There was some interbreeding and we all carry some of their genes. And I wonder, have we found Neanderthal remains that carry some of our DNA? Because it had to be a two way street. Why did we flourish while well, they finally died out? They were more robust, they were stronger, they were better adapted to the ice age conditions that we found outside Africa. And we'll learn they were far more intelligent, creative, advanced in many ways like us than we'd been giving them credit for. So how did we gain the advantage and what was that advantage? Is the answer simply in our cognitive development, our, our brains? They may not be bigger, but they're more complex. And our adaptability. Um, what lessons then from that chapter of our long and often challenging history of survival can we apply to the challenges that we faced ahead? Yeah. And we have about the best team ever to ponder all that with us today. Thomas Wynn returns. He joined us a couple months ago on first sculpture from hand axes to figure stones, those utilitarian stone duels produced, produced for millions of years that are a few truly works of art. You must look at that uh, interview now on our YouTube and Facebook videos. Thomas is a pioneer of evolutionary cognitive archaeology. He taught at the University of Colorado and Colorado Springs from 1977 to 
2022. He's now a distinguished professor emeritus, and he spent much of the 70s and 80s on archaeological projects in Europe and Africa. He published widely on the Paleolithic ancestors, so he's covered the whole human story. We also are joined by Fred Coolidge. Fred is a psychologist well known for his work in cognitive archaeology. He is a professor, been a professor of psychology at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs since 1979 and co-directs the Center for Cognitive Archaeology there. He also teaches for the Center of Cognitive and Brain Sciences at the Indian Institute of Technology in India. And together they are prolific collaborators and co-authors. They've established the Center for Cognitive Archaeology at the University of Colorado. They've published over 50 articles and a few books in cognitive archaeology, uh, many on the Neanderthal, uh, how to think like a Neanderthal, the rise of Homo sapiens, the evolutionary modern, modern thinking, and an introduction to evolutionary cognitive archaeology. Um, and with together, they have developed the enhanced working memory hypothesis. We'll ask them about that to explain why Homo sapiens endured while our cousins uh, died out. Welcome, gentlemen. It's good to Thank have you. you. Hello, it's good Tom. to have you back, Hello, Tom, Fred. and good to meet you, Fred. I appreciate that. Yeah. What a long and distinguished careers. But more interesting is this productive collaboration that you've both had uh, over the years with so much that you've done together. How did this start? archaeology psychology that's a good combination for cognitive anthropology well, how yeah. did you how did that start you're both at the same university what happened take it take it fred we've been on campus together about 20 years and i don't think we ever said anything but hello so we were cordial but the conversation didn't carry and we didn't even answer the question how are you how are you and then we'd walk away <laughs> So I was getting ready to go to teach in India, and I knew, you know, water is precious there. And so I was going to take my last bath, warm bath, before I went to India for four months. And I was reading uh, a Scientific American article back in 2000, 1999, and it said, once we are not alone. Well, I had never taken even a single course in anthropology or archaeology. But I, was, I wanted to be an Egyptologist, and in fifth grade, my parents said, no. You have to get a steady job. So from fifth grade on, I was thinking about a steady job. And so um, I didn't get to take anthropology. I knew I could get a job as a psychologist. So I was reading the article and it said about 500,000 years ago, there were five or six species of humans. And I said, wow. And then it said 100,000 years ago, there were only two. And I figured out before the I read further that it must have been the Anatols and us. I knew that much, although that may not be accurate now. But anyway, I got to the end and it said, and then there was only us. And so this curator of the American History Museum and a natural history museum in New York City, who was writing the article said, it must have been language that Neanderthals were a linguistic. And I thought that is ridiculous. I mean, I knew nothing about anthropology, but I knew that modern vervet monkeys teach their young three different sounds for three different kinds of predators that elicits three different kinds of responses. So if it's an eagle sound, they go down the tree. If it's a snake or tiger sound, they goes up the tree. And I said, Neanderthals had words. They could name things. I thought it was ridiculous. I had just published an article in developmental neuropsychology at that time. And it said, um, there's these executive functions, primarily the frontal lobe. And it's a metaphor for our frontal lobe seem to make the decisions. With input from all over the rest of the brain, the decision-making is part of the frontal lobes. And so I found out that executive functions are not only highly heritable. Like I, I think I wrote in that article, they're heritable by over 70%, more heritable. Our ability to make decisions, inhibit, and plan and organize, more heritable than intelligence, which is highly heritable. In the, in the literature about 10 years later, somebody said, uh, Coolidge is wrong. They're not 80% heritable, they're 90% heritable. <laughs> but also through, through this statistical analysis, we found that it was polygenic, that there were many genes that contribute, which makes sense. 
to our ability to have these executive functions, make decisions, inhibit, et cetera. So I realized, well, I've got an explanation. What happens if we were a little bit better at making decisions when the environment changes? What happens if we could use those decision-making processes to extract more resources for the environment? So Neanderthal said executive functions, but we had maybe a gene comes online and, and we have superior executive functions. Well, no, let's not say superior, Tom. Let's say better, oh, better executive, not. better, better executive functions. And communication, perhaps. Yeah. So I went into his office. He was associate dean at the time. And I went into his office and he said hello. And I said hello. And uh, we got over our basic conversation. And I said, listen, <laughs> I think this guy's wrong. I think Neanderthal said language. I don't think that's the issue. I think we made decisions better. We could plan and organize better. Mm -hmm. And so Tom said, well, what do you want to do with this? And I said, well, my parents said I couldn't become an Egyptologist. So could we publish it in an archaeological journal? And then my, my life will be complete and fulfilled. And so, um, so that next, next, so Tom, I provided the basics of the neuropsychology, how the right. brain works in terms of executive functions. And, and where the neurons reside, primarily in frontal lobes. And Tom provided the archeological evidence, which was relatively easy for him. And so just within a year, we had published in the Cambridge Archeological Journal. I also went home and told my wife, well, that's it. My career in archeology span is over. I've got one big good idea and that's it, I'm done. And she said, don't worry, Ducky, you'll think of something else. And she was kind of right. So Tom and I have had the next 22 years very productive. Oh, it makes so much sense. Story. It makes story. so much sense that they would have speech, right? All animals yeah. utter something. They all have signals. Right. They all have a language of yeah. sorts. Yeah. 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 So that makes so much sense. Yeah. Okay. We have to uh, brook the issue Neanderthal, Neanderthal. Do you want to explain that one? Well, I also would like to have, give give Tom an opportunity to also oh. tell the part of the story that from his side. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Both. Yeah, that's a, that's a total fiction, of course. <laughs> no, that, that's basically it. Fred walked into my office. He had a wonderful idea. Uh, I had never been very enthusiastic about the language argument uh, about Neanderthals. And I thought, wow, this is really a good alternative. I had spent my career talking about the exciting field of spatial cognition, which nobody is, seems to be very interested in. But um, executive functions are another matter. And it turned out to be relatively straightforward to sort of trace in the archaeological record some evidence for this transition that Fred was uh, hypothesizing. And um, it, was, it was very successful. And today, um, I would guess there are two hypotheses about why modern humans had an advantage. Uh, one, a whole bunch of people still advocate for language. They'll die soon. Um, and then we'll have the enhanced working memory hypothesis, which is really, I, I think, probably the best developed hypothesis for the possible advantage of, of modern humans. So it's, it's been a very fruitful collaboration. I, I should say that, that he and I have, have complementary working styles, um, and it's, it's just worked very well. Um, and it's been, it's been a joy for me to work with Fred for the, for the last 20 years. Um, so, so anyway, um, Neanderthal or Neanderthal? Um, that's that's a good, really interesting question. I mean, the as I'll say in, in a second, the, the original identified Neanderthal was found in the Neander Valley in Germany in 1856, and the German word for valley is Tal. And in 1856, that was spelled T H A L, Tal. That's how it's pronounced in, in German. So Neanderthal, Neander Valley. Okay. In the first decade of the 20th century, I don't remember exactly what year, German spelling got revised officially. And the um, spelling for tall um, dropped the H and became tall, T-A-L. So, so in German, the official spelling of Neanderthal is without the H. And since it's a German word, it seems that we should probably follow the German spelling. However, it got a little bit more complicated because when Neanderthals were thought to be a separate species back in the late part of the 19th century, they were officially dubbed 
Homo neanderthalensis with the age. And if you know anything about biological nomenclature, the first person who names something gets the spelling. Uh -huh. and, and, you, and it's virtually impossible to change from that point on. So if you use the term Homo neanderthalensis, you have to use the H. Um, but if you're using the colloquial term, you yeah. should probably not use the H. This is confusing enough that everybody's given up entirely. And uh, <laughs> like conjugating much, our verbs. Yeah, yeah. We use whatever spelling you're comfortable with. That's okay. Yeah. Both are acceptable. But the pronunciation is without the H. Got the it. pronunciation is Neanderthal. Even if Got you're it. doing it in English or in German or in Latvian or in Serbo Croatian or in Nepalese, it's Neanderthal. So, yeah. so in, that, has some in, that period, yeah. in that period, Laura and Paul, um, by 1870 or something, then it, it became accepted that there was Neanderthal, I mean, Homo Neanderthalensis. Yeah. But remember, genus and species that would put them in a separate species uh, initially. Later, it evolved to uh, a subspecies. So they'd say Homo sapiens, sapiens, that's us, mm -hmm. the subspecies, the third term, or Homo sapiens neanderthalensis that put them in the subspecies. So you didn't have quite that kind of controversy. But Laura, you, you heralded uh, an idea that we have this idea that they were just cavemen. And part of that problem started back in the 1870s. So within about 20 years where they're recognizing this wasn't an animal, this was an ancient hominin, which they wrote then and said, um, uh, this guy Haeckel was big on taxonomy back in the 1870s. And he was aware of Homo neanderthalensis. So he was also aware that there would probably be other species, which is pretty kind of cool for 1870, you know, because it, because indeed, the, the Den Denisovans and you know all these other um, more recent hominins. So, um, so we came up with an idea for a species that hadn't yet been found, mm -hmm. and he called them Homo stupidus. <laughs> oh, and right. it didn't go anywhere. But the idea that it was a so he really didn't publish that about Neanderthals. He published it about an unknown species that he predicted would be found in his giant taxonomy. Okay, so that kind of started the negativity around it. Ah, interesting. Hmm. Because oh, well, it's really quite to the makeover that we're giving, um, yeah. and, and even sequencing the DNA. Yeah. I mean, I'm wondering, okay, what is that telling us? Yeah. Yeah. What were you going to say, Tom? No, that, that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll say it when I start the presentation. Okay, but I want to come back to the term cognitive archaeology. The study, uh, it's like the archaeology of the brain. Well, has this term been around a long time prior to the work that you're doing? I mean, is this a commonly accepted term? No, I think that the term itself was coined by um, Colin Renfrew, who eventually became Lord Renfrew. He's an, an English archaeologist in about 1980. Um, I, I'd been working in the field for a few years by then, but I never talked about cognitive archaeology. I talked about intelligence back then. I was using Piaget and some things, as you know. But, but the term sort of caught on in the 1980s, didn't become really popular until about you know, 19, late 1990s. So the, the field has really been around for about 50 years. So and this it, is interesting, your methodology to look at the cognitive development, the thinking, the mental life, because you're not examining brains. You can't take a brain and and decipher our life right really that fully but when we saw you decipher these hand axes and all the nuances and then the all the study and then the implications it was like reading a book if you could do that with a hand axe i'm uh, really excited about what you can do with the fuller archaeological the dna the the anthropology uh, of this i mean there's a lot that you're deciphering from just very right. few clues. And, I mean, the, the basic idea behind cognitive archaeology is that you take theories and ideas developed in the psychological sciences and use those to interpret the archaeological record. That's really all there is to it. I mean, it's yeah. it, that it, it takes knowing something about the brain, something about cognitive function, uh, and bring that to the interpretation of 
fossils, stone tools, garbage, all of the things that archaeologists love to study. Right, now, yeah. now including DNA. And so it's good that you're a psychologist, um, Fred, because that's exactly what's, what's needed here. That's well, the, the, the other part of this equation. The archaeology of the brain. It's an opportunity for you to be the archaeologist <laughs> that you always wanted to be, and you get to study the field that you're trained and uh, a professor. Yeah, you're of, adding so. some new, new <laughs> insights to this. So. Yeah. Wow. And, and according to Fred, apparently archaeologists have more fun parties than psychologists. So. Yeah, <laughs> that sounds, sounds true to me. Uh, oh, indeed. Well, let's yeah. take a look at your presentation. And uh, yeah, let's, let's go through this. This is going to be exciting. Okay. Um, the title's a little bit different from, from the one I forgot the title. So I just titled it The Neanderthal Mind in Light of Recent Discoveries. And what I'm going to do is take 15 to 20 minutes and give a sort of basic anthropological uh, look at Neanderthals. And then I'm gonna hand it over to Fred uh, to take the psychological slant. The anthropological bit is probably more familiar to, to people. Um, so we're gonna give Fred the, the nod and let him take the majority of, of the talk. Um, <laughs> we, we've already alluded to this uh, in, at, at several points in something I call the Neanderthal myth. And this is an, an interpretation that developed in the late part of the 19th century. We can blame Heckel a little bit for it, but the primary culprits turn out to be um, French paleoanthropologists who in, in the 1890s excavated a couple of very famous Neanderthals from French sites, the site at Le Moustier in, in particular, but a couple of others. And there was a, a, a burial from Le Moustier, which was almost a complete Neanderthal. And it was reconstructed by the, the French paleontologist named Marcel Amboul. And the, the individual turned out to be relatively aged by Neanderthal standards, probably in the order of 40 to, to 50 years old and suffered from rickets and arthritis and a number of other pathological conditions. But um, Marcel Amboul came into it thinking these were primitive humans and he reconstructed it that way. Um, and th th that's all okay, except that it caught popular imagination in a dramatic way in Europe. If you remember this is the 1890s, you know, the early part of the 20th century, this was before uh, World War I when we figured out we actually were all crazy. Um, and th there's a lot of optimism and then the idea that there was a primitive kind of human running around, um, just fascinated people. Uh, some of the earliest French cinema um, includes stories about Neanderthals stealing women from modern humans, and they were always hunched over and you know carrying clubs. This is where the idea that Neanderthals carried clubs and smacked people over the head. And this, th this idea just spread like wildfire. Um, and, it's and partially and, true, though, with the interbreeding, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah and uh, so this image is the one that almost everybody carries about Neanderthals because it entered modern culture. And Neanderthals today are probably the one prehistoric hominin that everybody has heard of. And everybody thinks they know something about it. And most of what they know is drawn not from science, but from this old myth about Neanderthals that was presented now, you know, 130 years ago. Um, we now have, have a much different view of Neanderthals. The current image is, is much more human-like. We, we bicker a little bit about whether it was completely human or a little bit different, but really we're, we're talking about a population of humans uh, that was very much like us. And so the, the current trend is, is to reconstruct Neanderthals very much like modern humans living at the same time. So I'm gonna show you some images. There's a kind of cottage industry out there now for reconstructing Neanderthals to see who can come up with the best, coolest looking reconstructing of your Neanderthals. You can find a lot of these things online. Um, and, and some of them, right, I think are quite good and quite compelling. Others are a little bit silly. Um, and when we get to, to the little bit silly, you probably recognize this. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, 10 years ago, it was uh, this, this ad series for 
a automobile insurance agency, you know, had this idea of misunderstood Neanderthals. And I guess it was a short television series that came out of it. And so the idea of, you know, dressing up a human to look like a Neanderthal, but having them really no different from us was a point of humor. And it's, of course, playing off that whole Neanderthal myth and the incongruous you know, co-occurrence of a Neanderthal in modern human behavior was considered to be amusing, um, not considered to be serious science, that is on, on the part of most people. But it turns out that it's really pretty serious science. So what can we say about Neanderthals? Um, this is the geographic distribution of Neanderthals as it is currently known today. I wouldn't be surprised if it expands a little bit more to the east. Um, this map probably tells you as much about modern politics as it tells you about Neanderthals, uh, because you can see the area of the world where Neanderthals have been found are areas which have fairly stable political systems um, and well-developed scientific establishments. In other words, we know a lot about Neanderthals in Western Europe. We know a lot about Neanderthals in the Middle East, it turns out. Um, and now we're beginning to find out about Neanderthals way over here in Asia, wow. in, in the Altai Mountains. And I, I point this out because some of the most interesting archaic DNA comes from Neanderthals living way out on the eastern edge of the Neanderthal distribution. Um, the, I'll say more about this in a second, but the Neanderthals split off from us over 500,000 years ago, maybe as long ago as 800,000 years ago. This is what the genetic evidence tells us. And they evolved to have an adaptation in these Northern habitats, uh, especially during glacial periods. They actually stayed in Europe during glacial periods as opposed to abandoning <laughs> Europe during glacial periods, which previous humans had done. So they developed a very effective hunting and gathering adaptation to this Eurasian environment and did just fine for several hundred thousand years until about 50,000 years ago, um, some folks started moving up from Africa. And these were our ancestors. And within 20,000 years, Neanderthals vanished as a distinct population. This was true all over. Wherever our ancestors showed up, within really probably a few thousand years, the local populations disappeared. And the question is, how much did the local populations contribute to modern people? Um, we now know that they did, but relatively little, as it turns out. What that says about modern humans might be a little bit disturbing, and we might come, come back and talk about that at some point. So let's talk about what Neanderthals were like. Um, most of the anatomical differences that you would recognize if you met them on, on the street are related to the skull. And on, on the left, you have a modern human male. Um, I actually selected a picture of a fairly, fairly robust modern male to compare it to a Neanderthal. But you can see there are some very distinct differences between them. First of all, most obvious are probably these brow ridges. Um, for Neanderthals, they include the, the frontal sinuses. Been a lot of talk about what they, their function was, but it, it seems to be primarily to at, as a structure to support the size of the face, because that's the other thing that's true about Neanderthals, is they had very large faces. Um, so they're high from top to bottom, and they're broad across here. Um, and they just had heavier faces than, than we did. And the teeth were on average a little bit larger, not a lot. The mandibles were bigger. Um, so the whole thing was just a, a heavy face. And that was something you would probably notice if a Neanderthal you know, walked into your dentist office while you're in the chair. Um, you might uh, say, oh, that's kind of an interesting looking guy um, or woman. Um, the other thing that's that's most most interesting about Neanderthals is the nose. Um, Neanderthals had very large noses, as the nasal cavity itself is very large, and 
most common interpretation of this is that the noses are large to warm and moisten cold, dry air. And if you live in a cold environment, like if you live up in the mountains of Colorado, uh, or you know, if you live in Flagstaff, um, and the winters are cold and dry, um, the, if you have a large nose, it gives it warms the air and provides moisture before it makes it to the lungs. And so that seems to be a part of the cold adaptation of Neanderthals. And that's an important point because most of the unusual features that we associate with Neanderthals anatomically are probably tied to this cold adaptation. Some of them may be the result of genetic drift because Neanderthal populations were always very small. I'll talk about that in, in a bit. But now, this cold adaptation seems to be a recurring theme for Neanderthals. Fred will say a bit more about brain size and brains later. There are some features below the head that are distinctive. First of all, um, Neanderthal on the left, modern human on, on the right. Uh, Neanderthals were relatively short by modern human standards. Um, the example we used to give in class all, all the time was John Stewart, but John Stewart's been off television now for about 10 years and nobody recognizes him anymore. Or, or President Sarkozy from France, who's also not there anymore. So it's all of the examples where you have to come up with some others. But, you know, 5'7 for a male would have been, you know, a, a good size Neanderthal. There are a couple who were bigger, but for the most part, they're relatively short. And uh, females, a little bit shorter than that. Um, Neanderthals were also relatively stocky. That is, they were short, but they were really solidly built. Part of that is cold adaptation. That is, if you have a short, stocky body, it's better at preserving heat and than a tall, thin body. And so, again, it, it's tied to the cold adaptation. But you can see on the left here, there are a long sequence of sort of small features that distinguish Neanderthals a little bit from modern humans. Um, so for example, large elbow joint, bowed and short forearm. Um, but I, I like to say, if, if you ever um, think of the Bulgarian weightlifting team, um, it's, it's that's the body build we're talking about for, uh, for Neanderthals. Um, so it, among other things, it seems to be a, a body build for exertion. That is, uh, Neanderthals were not only short and stocky, they were also very powerful in a muscular sense. If you look at the places where the muscles attach on the long bones, the articulations are very pronounced and suggest that the muscle mass itself was considerably well-developed, let me put it that way, which brings up the interesting question, was this genetic or was this the result of their way of life? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, and, and that's a tough one to answer. It looks as if it was partially genetic, but it was also partially tied to their way of life. That is, they, they led a very strenuous day-to-day -day existence, many of them. Um, and that results in a different kind of body than uh, those of us who are academics and sit around in our offices all day. Um, so um, the interesting thing about it is none of these characteristics is really outside the range of human variability. I mean, I sort of made fun of the weightlifting team, which I probably shouldn't do. Um, there may be one living next to me, and you know who knows what what they <laughs> might think. But um, but there's a lot of variability in modern humans, and what we see in Neanderthals is a concentration of features that is sort of just a little bit outside the average for modern humans. Mm -hmm. um, and well, this, within our bell curve, but not the yeah, average. It, 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 exactly. Um, so there's, we can't go and point to a Neanderthal bone and say Neanderthals have the Neanderthal bone and modern humans don't have it. That doesn't work. When we get to DNA, it's a little bit different though. So let's, let's talk about DNA. That's probably the, in the last 10 years, the last 20 years, the um, domain that has produced the most interesting results about Neanderthals. And actually started in, in the 1990s when uh, techniques came up, became available to amplify small amounts of DNA. 
And the first attempts were done in the late 90s. And this is some of the bones that were used. It was from a site in um, Croatia called Vindija Cave. And if you treat bones appropriately, that is don't touch them when you excavate them and use very careful procedures uh, to clean the bone and get a bone sample, you can in fact recover archaic DNA from mm. bone. And not now, contaminate it, okay. Yeah, it, it degrades very rapidly and you have to remember that. Um, most of the Neanderthal DNA I'll be talking about is more recent than 100,000 years ago. Um, there have been some successes at recovering DNA from uh, older Neanderthals, but it's always very fragmentary and it's hard, not hard, it's hard to know what to do with it, to be perfectly honest. The oldest archaic DNA ever recovered was from a frozen mammoth, and it's pushing a million years, but that was very unusual because the mammoth actually had been frozen and embedded in permafrost, and the preservation was spectacular. And we don't yet have a frozen Neanderthal we can do that with. So we're really talking about the relatively recent past for most of this, but I would guess that over the years, techniques will develop and we'll be able to push back archaic DNA further and further in, into the past. Wow. So I need to talk a little bit about the ways you can use archaic DNA because a lot of people are unfamiliar with how it is used. There are two basic ways at least from an evolutionary point of view, that we use archaic DNA. Um, first, uh, we can use archaic DNA to measure degrees of relationship between individuals and between populations. So for example, you've probably all heard at this point that modern Europeans have two to 3% Neanderthal genes. That's been adjusted downwards. The initial numbers were two to four. Um, African populations have less than 1%. And this seems to have been secondary and it has passed back into Africa from other modern humans. There doesn't seem to be much evidence for direct interaction from Africans and, your, and Neanderthals. Curiously, um, and this is kind of important because um, Laura Lee mentioned something earlier about it being a two-way street. It may not have been a two-way street. Um, if, if you look at Neanderthal DNA, there is no gene recovered for Neanderthals that we know was acquired from modern humans. Ah. Um, uh, if we look at the mitochondrial DNA, for example, and mitochondrial DNA, if you remember your high school biology, is inherited only through the female line. That is, you get your mitochondrial DNA from your mom. Okay? And it turns out that there is um, no Neanderthal mitochondrial DNA in the human genome. That oh. is, um, so that's interesting, right? I mean, yeah. well, what, what does that mean? Um, yeah. There have been a lot of, lot of suggestions, but, uh, but one of the suggestions is that in interbreeding a male modern human and a female Neanderthal, the offspring may not itself have been fertile, which is, which is why the mitochondrial was not passed down from Neanderthal females mm -hmm. to modern human mm -hmm. offspring. Um, interestingly, Y chromosomes, which are of course carried only by males, we do have evidence for Neanderthal Y chromosome genes in modern human po populations. So that's actually kind of a, kind of a puzzle and I've always kind of poo-pooed it a little bit, but the evidence is now looking pretty strong that something was a little bit unexpected about the way interbreeding occurred between humans and Neanderthals. Another thing we can do is measure relationships of Neanderthals to one another uh, and discover things about mating patterns. And I'll say something about that in just a second. And final thing we can do is reconstruct evolutionary relationships between Neanderthals modern humans, and this interesting group called the Denisovans. Uh, and Denisovans are known pretty much only from their genome. Uh, it was recovered from a, initially from a finger bone uh, from a site in the, uh, in the Altai Mountains uh, in Central Asia. And they were trying to reconstruct Neanderthal DNA, and they came with this genome, which was clearly not Neanderthal, it was clearly not modern human. Uh, 
uh, nobody had seen it before. And so they labeled it the, the, the Denisovan um, from Denisova Cave. And it turns out that in some modern human populations, there are, is a significant amount of Denisovan DNA, especially in East Asia, uh, in um, the Pacific Islands, in uh, Papua New Guinea. Um, the, there seems to be a, a significant amount of Denisovan DNA, which leads to the possibility that there may be yet another group out there. We don't know, we're just beginning to do this and, and understand about prehistoric uh, genomes. So in summary, the, this way, this use of DNA is used to trace populations and to determine relationships to one another. The second way, which is in some ways more interesting and the one that Fred and I am more interested in, is to see if one can determine what the different genes meant for Neanderthal phenotypes. That is, what do the differences in genes mean for Neanderthal anatomy and Neanderthal behavior? And that turns out to be a much more difficult question to answer. Okay, um, so that you probably, if you follow the news, there's one of these, you know, archaeological discovery completely revises our understanding of human evolution. That seems to happen se several times a year. Um, as as a, an anthropologist, let me say the last time there was a complete rewrite of human evolution was 1978. Um, so, but you know, reporters like to sort of engage in hyperbole. But 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 several weeks ago, you, you may have, have seen that this report about these Neanderthals from Tarkarskaya Cave, I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, and they recovered uh, genomes from 11 individuals from the cave. Uh, they're Neanderthals. One of them was an adult male. There was his, one was from his teenage daughter. Now, um, I literally said, how the heck from a fragmentary bone did you know it was a teenager? Um, that turns out to be tough to do, not impossible, but somebody may, may be, a little optimistic here. But anyway, one of the adult males um, and his teenage daughter, which you can, you can tell from the amount of DNA they share. Um, then there was an adult female who was unrelated to that male. But there was a boy who appears to have been about a second cousin to that female. What does that tell us? Well, again, looking at how people relate to one another. And what the anthropologists concluded is that this was a relatively small group of people. Um, they estimate the group size between 10 and 20, which by the way, is fairly typical for estimates of Neanderthal group sizes. Um, and that they practice something called patrilocal residence. And if you don't remember your anthropology course when you were an undergraduate, that means that the males stay put and the females leave at adolescence and join another group. Okay, so patrilocal males stay put, females leave. And that would explain the pattern that we see. Um, so his teenage daughter was probably getting ready to move to probably an adjacent community of some kind. So that's kind, kind of interesting. Um, and the other thing you, you can do uh, is reconstruct evolutionary trees using similarity of DNA to one another. And this is mm -hmm. the current best estimate of what I say are the reason, a recent branch of hominy and family tree as revealed by ancient DNA. Wow. And it looks as if there was a common ancestral population 750,000 years ago. After that, there was a speciation between the African groups, which is what we belong to, and the Eurasian groups. Then about 600,000 years ago, there was a split between the Neanderthals and the Denisovans. So what this means is we've been separated from this group for maybe as much as 800,000 years. Wow. The Neanderthals have been separate from the Denisovans or had been separate from the Denisovans for maybe 600,000 years. That's enough time for evolutionary differences to emerge. Maybe not dramatic ones, but 
Certainly, we would expect some evolutionary differences between populations that were largely separate from one another for that amount of time. And of course, we're down here, modern humans. All right, this is where my eyes start glazing over when genetics, geneticists start talking about these things, which are estimates about how much admixture there was between these prehistoric populations. Remember, we're talking about Neanderthals, Denisovans, and modern humans. So it appears as if you know, there's some gene flow between Denisovans, that is admixture between Denisovans and modern humans, um, especially in East Asia and Oceania. That's where I see it most clearly. And the gene flow between Neanderthals and modern humans is primarily appears to be in Europe. Anything in Africa appears to have been indirect. The interesting thing also is that based on these genomes, there appears to be a mysterious population um, unidentified that contributed to both of these, to, to all of these groups at some point that nobody has actually found. Um, so it's a very complicated business. And if you sort of read this, it's easy to get confused very quickly. All of this is based on similarity of DNA to one another. So what can we interpret about phenotypes from DNA? And this is the harder question, remember. Um, so an analysis, an analysis of the genetic variation shows that Neanderthal DNA is 99.7% identical to the DNA of modern humans. That's a 0.3% difference. Doesn't sound like very much, but remember the human genome consists of about 3 billion base pairs. So 0.3% means that there's somewhere on the order of 900,000 to a million base pair differences between Neanderthals and modern humans. Now it sounds like a lot, right? But most of them fall in areas of the genome that don't clearly have any function. Um, we used to call it junk DNA, but now we know that that's probably not a good idea because some of it probably did something. But if you're looking for genes that actually code for proteins, um, very few of those actually code for protein differences, but there are a few. Now comes the hard part, is interpreting what the differences are. So if we identify that a particular gene is possessed by Neanderthals, but not possessed by modern humans, how do we determine its function? If we go back, you know, two to three percent of the DNA in most Eurasians has a Neanderthal origin. Another way to look at that is to say, what percentage of the Neanderthal genome is actually bouncing around in modern humans today? Because we don't all share the same two to 3%. And it turns out that about 40% uh, of the Neanderthal genome mm -hmm. is sprinkled about modern humans. Wow, they don't so say one, that in the articles, do they? That is no, so they don't. So one thing you can do, if you find an unusual gene that um, you can find an individual modern human, if you're lucky, who carries that particular Neanderthal gene and then try to figure out what its function is. Okay. That's one way to do it. Okay. Another way to figure it out is try to grow, the, grow the, uh, the actual cells, which is interesting and kind of creepy in science fiction. Um, <laughs> so for example, you, you can get a neural stem cells and you can implant a Neanderthal gene in the, in the DNA of the neural stem cells and see what happens. Um, they're called organoids and they grow. Um, and it turns out that some of these alleles in, that are tied to neural development, if you grow an organoid with them, they grow differently than the ones from modern humans. But we have to be very careful because gene expression is a very, very complicated field and it's way out of my expertise to talk about. And just because there are differences in the DNA doesn't mean there's going to be a significant difference in anatomy. Um, 
you have to know about the environment of development, the genetic environment of development, the physical environment of development. There are lots of mechanisms in the genome for starting at two different places and ending up at the same place in terms mm -hmm. of development. So we have to be really careful about that. And probably the most interesting thing about the genetic differences for Neanderthals is that there seem to be a lot of differences in genes for skin. That seems to be the, the most popular one. And we think that basically modern Eurasian skin is probably largely inherited from Neanderthals. Um, that's how common it is. And if you think about it, Neanderthals were there for 600,000 years and they had a skin type that was adapted to those environments. It would be very advantageous for Africans coming out uh, to get that kind of light skin um, because it's very adaptive in high latitudes. A lot there less also, fun, yeah. There, there are also genes for, for the immune system. So the Neanderthal immune system seem to have been a little different from ours. Mm -hmm. But from our point of view, what we'll be talking about in a second, are, are the genes for neural development. And there are several of these. Again, you may have seen this article came out a couple of months ago. Um, it's the work of Wieland Huttner, who is a neuroscientist at, at Max Planck. And he identified a variety of the gene TKTL1 that Neanderthals lacked. And this particular gene becomes active in the developing human cortex, especially the frontal cortex. Um, so basically, the, there's a gene that humans have Neanderthals don't have that seems to be involved in neural development of the frontal lobes. Now, you can probably see from based on what Fred said about why Fred and I would be very excited by that, uh, because if we're positing a difference in executive reasoning ability between humans and Neanderthals, uh, we have a possible uh, genetic indication of that. So now, now's a pretty good time to uh, answer questions I think about uh, what I've talked about so far. Okay. Um, well, first of all, to go back to your beginning, showing a lot of images, and I know some of them were taking the skulls and putting the skin on and recreating from a, an accurate. I just have a pet peeve on the messy hair that's always shown with Neanderthals <laughs> yeah. and the, yes. the dirty, you know. It's like every animal grooms itself, and that would be a survival technique. And right. they would have bear grease to use for like hair, hair conditioner. You know, I, I really get irritated <laughs> by that. It's just a pet peeve. Who wouldn't comb your hair? If they can wear eagle talon jewelry and shoulder, you know, they're combing their hair. Um, right. Potentially. That okay. wouldn't come, by the way, when it disappeared. That, that most of the archaeologists don't comb their hair either, so. Okay. <laughs> and, you know, and Einstein was very smart, didn't. So there you yeah, go. Yeah. Next, anyway, next anyway. Point. And so also, would that mean then that, that we really have a much earlier developmental history than our 250,000 years if our common ancestors went that far back? I mean, that makes right. our story so much more interesting, doesn't it? And it yeah, explains it a lot. Do you want to just comment on that, that our longer well, history than we do? Well, there, there, there are a couple of things. First, the, the academic skeptic in me always j jumps in and says, yeah, based on the assumptions that they brought to the analysis, those are the dates that you get. And there are assumptions about mutation rates that they apply. And if the mutations rates are what you assume they are, then those are the dates that you get. If it turns out that the mutation rate is a little bit different, you'll get a different set, set of dates. So um, the general estimates for the Neanderthal human split generally vary between 500,000 and 800,000 years. And I think that we can say with confidence. Um, I, I, exactly I know about the subspecies, but I'm just saying, you say that they're so like us, and then they go back right. so much further. I mean, I'm just thinking our, our well, family yeah, remember tree, it, our trunk of our family 500,000 years from an evolutionary point of view is not necessarily Blink very long. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and the interbreeding, the interbreeding, and you mentioned the family groups. So how often to get two to three to percent in our DNA? How often was interbreeding happening? Not every 
result of interbreeding is going to survive and nor is it found but i mean is this consensual family there there were pretty slim pickings about mates to choose from there was not a lot of population in these areas um, that, but was this by force that, was me. this i mean how, how do you think this happened uh we don't know uh and that's the, the simple way to put it um for a while, they were thinking that there were only a few cases, you know, 60 to 80,000 years ago. Now it looks like it was probably more common, but there's only about two to 3% in, in any Eurasian, and that's not very much. Uh, and so it doesn't look as if it was sort of basically two populations just merging with one another. Some people right. still think that might, might be the case because among other things, the Neanderthal population apparently was very small. Um, the, mm. the, the genetic evidence points to maybe 10,000 Neanderthals. That's it at any one time. Then they um, would suffer from genetic interbreeding and not lack of right. diversity. The, the, the archaeologists are a little suspicious about that number because we have a lot of archaeological evidence for Neanderthals. And okay. they don't look that rare. But of course, no one wants to talk to an archaeologist about that. So, <laughs> so the archaeologists and the geneticists disagree about how many Neanderthals there were. But what they do agree about is that it was relatively few compared to modern humans. Mm -hmm. um, and that Neanderthals lived in small groups, and they were widely dispersed on the landscape. Mm -hmm. Modern humans showed up, they lived in large groups. Mm -hmm. and they were not dispersed on the landscape. They really were concentrated in much larger numbers. So one of the leading hypotheses now for the disappearance of Neanderthals um, is that we simply swamped them genetically. That is, there were so many of us uh, mm -hmm. that you know, Neanderthals didn't have a chance just from a demographic point of view. Um, so, yeah. they, they Laura, 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 you said they go back and I don't, don't know if I heard you correctly, but you said the Anatols go back further. It's the common no, no, no. ancestor. No? No, I, so, I was just saying that our family tree is. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you check all. Probably 800,000 years ago, the whole tree had a common yeah. ancestor back, probably Homo heidelbergensis. And, and I only mentioned that because we okay. are more like them than we had previously thought. I mean, with this genetic 99.7%. I mean, that right. that's interesting. Mm. So um, I, I'd love to go to Chris Van Poole. And I want to thank Chris for mm. introducing us to um, Tom Wynn and then uh, and, and also pressing the case for let's learn about the cognitive. So if you have something to, to say, Chris, um, now or later, I just wanted to start okay. off with you and she doesn't have her so video there she is okay. <clears throat> okay hey so this is chris and todd um we're having some uh, interconnectivity problems and so our camera isn't working right now or it'll crash if we try to use it um it's great uh, hearing all of this i have a quick question if you all don't mind so there seems to be some good evidence about neanderthals practicing some cannibalism and uh mm -hmm. What we now know about the genetics and the cognitive structure of uh, Neanderthals, I wonder if there's any new insights into the nature of that cannibalism. We know amongst modern humans that sometimes there will be cannibalism that's respectful, where people will eat their uh, family members to have them as part of themselves to gain their strength. Then other times people will eat others for either as a potential food source or perhaps um, as a kind of a sign of dominance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let me pass this one on to Fred. Because wasn't there a family, a whole family of Neanderthals that were cannibalized that they found? Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Well, let's, I think we can answer a couple questions here that cross is when we talk about Neanderthal extinction, uh, one of the questions I think was germs, wasn't it? Yeah, and that was from Tony oh, Hall. Yeah. 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 And, and um, so, but just like, why do we sleep? There, there isn't one reason. Okay, so probably, why did they go extinct? There probably isn't one reason. So we're gonna look at their extinction as a function of many factors. Germs could have been one of them, a, a different kind of immunity. And actually the world was warming up from a glacial period when they started to go extinct. So in some respects, it became easier to live in the environment, but if you were cold adapted, you might have more trouble. Um, a pension for cannibalism, could be a factor. 
amongst germs, amongst competition for resources with the more clever Homo sapiens being able to extract more resources. But we saw those pictures of the two bodies and it looked like most estimates say around 30 to 35% more calories for a Neanderthal to walk. So that meant they had to get this protein from big animals. They mm -hmm. couldn't fall back like we were gracile and thin and they couldn't fall back on fish or birds. They needed the big hunt. We hunted also, yeah. but we could fall back on, on these you know, less protein rich sources. The Neanderthals did that. They had a, a, a varied diet, but at the same time, if it took 30% more calories just to walk, imagine their daily activities, they're gonna need meat, the, the big hunt. And they were uh, very good at developing the tools to go and go after the biggest game of all there, the mammoth, right? They devised techniques to take that down. Um, okay, thank you. There's also plaque on teeth. Somebody's doing a study of plaque on teeth and they found that there's shared microorganisms between Neanderthal and humans, which means either a lot of kissing or shared food, right? That was the conclusions I read. So more evidence of communal activities. Right. Yeah. I, w I would like to point out too, um, Tony, when you say, um, are there measurable differences between those of us with greater than 3% and less than 2%? And they're actually doing those studies, those uh, like 23andMe, these companies that will test your DNA. Um, you'll find out how many variants you have. And that's how people, modern people can find out for $50 or $99 how much Neanderthal DNA you have. Then what they've done is they've taken, like the first study was, um, I think Kelso, uh, Daneman and Kelso, I think, they took 115,000 genomes from modern uh, United Kingdom residents. And they looked at only four behavioral dimensions. And they did find a correlation between the greater amount percentage of Neanderthal DNA and, for example, a different chronotype. So they, they found out that in these modern UK people, if you had more Neanderthal, you were more of a night owl. You, you, you preferred the evening more. So that's just kind of interesting. So there is some work with that, but it, but it tends to be um, a little unsophisticated. So for example, when I got my DNA, it said your variants, your Neanderthal variant DNA say you should be afraid. No, you have no fear of heights. Tony, the second step on a ladder scares me. So I knew that I knew that was baloney. I knew that was, but it's in its infancy. But not this Daneman and Kelso work. It's very sophisticated and they they line up how many variants with these behaviors. It's just that they haven't done very sophisticated survey of those behaviors. Um, we, we'd like to see, here's the possibility too, is we still look down a microscope at at DNA or chromosomes, right? And we go, it looks like an X. It looks like a Y. I mean, with 3 billion base pairs along these chromosomes, that's about the silliest thing that anybody could imagine is you're just talking about the shape. So we used to think, oh, the number of chromosomes, pairs of chromosomes might be related to behavioral sophistication. You know, it turns out horses have more. It turns out Ferns have 600 pairs. So clearly, and humans only have 23 pairs. So it's clearly not about the number of chromosomes. Um, we thought we had hundreds of thousands, not millions of special genes. Turns out only maybe 30,000 genes are really active in, in uh, modern humans. So when we say we're 99.7% similar, somebody else asked that question. We share 90% similarity in our DNA with rats over 98% with chimpanzees. So maybe the story isn't resolved in the similarity of our DNA. Interesting. That's what we're doing now. That's what we're doing now. But that maybe is not where the story resides. But also, if, it, if the story does reside in that uh, common percentage, high percentage, then the difference, as Tom said, that 0.3%, then it must have a massive difference. Look at the difference between us and, and chimpanzees. And it turns out that most of the gene differences between us and chimps, even though we're 98% DNA similar, does with neural coding, brain coding. 
And of course, chimps do not have sophisticated language. They don't publish magazines. They don't have social blogs. So, so the tiny bit of difference might have been monumental difference ultimately in our behavior. And that is really where your enhanced working memory hypothesis comes in, is you're saying it's the accumulation of all these minor differences that add up to a huge expressive difference, basically. That's right. Yeah. Now, and I don't know of this book. Do you know, Tom, do you, uh, how the Neanderthal predation created modern humans? No, I don't know it. Oh, it okay. Can you Who tell asked? us the premise on that book real quick? Uh, Who's Nick, asking? Nick Nielsen? Nick, did you, did you, would you like to follow up on that? Thank you. Could, could I just finish your one question? Oh, sure. I, I, don't know the, yeah. I, don't know the, I don't know the author's thesis well enough to explain it off the top of my head. But unlike your position, he emphasizes the differences of Neanderthals from, from Homo sapiens. And he suggested that uh, there was a period in history in which uh, Neanderthals did predate to human beings. Based on what evidence? Um, like I said, I don't know the book well enough yeah. to okay. sum it up. Yeah, huh. that's a good well, question. Nick, just you know, just from the from that brief description, um, who's here talking about that predation? Uh, the us. author of the book. No, no, is, us. Oh. You and I. We're not. This isn't a discussion of Neanderthals with other Neanderthals about how they predated humans. So. It can't be a major factor. Would you agree, Nick? Otherwise, we wouldn't be here if they had won that predation. So there was well, some if, predation. If, if their numbers, if their numbers were very small and our numbers were very large, even if they predated us, you know, we could have still outcompeted them. Yeah. So, well, let's move on. Oh, so, okay. And Tony, you, you have a final you, question Nick. as well. Appreciate that. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Thank well, you, Nick. Yeah. One of the things I think I heard was that that the genes that we inherit may be different uh, from different people. Like yeah. I may inherit a different three percent than you do, right. and so right. that makes the problem extremely complex. I think to associate uh, what the benefits are of, of that part of our, our genome, but I think it would be fascinating if once we do get a significant amount of data to see if there are any things. I mean, do do Briggs test or other things, does propensity to be a lineman on a football team, do various things like that, do they enter in in some way? Right. It would be interesting to know. And it's uh, yeah. it's just it's a field that's just beginning. So as that's Fred true. was saying. So. Yeah. But 40% no, it, sprinkled around, is that a lot of interactions or is that um, just a, a mixed bag from a few interactions. I mean, that's interesting. So, mm. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, you did, you did mention skin, and I think that's a very interesting thing. And But uh, thank you. This is a fascinating discussion. I'll, I'll shut up now. Oh, no. Thank you very much, no, Tony. No, no. Always it was useful. But also, Laura, when I'm on a camping trip for a week, I have no mirror. I don't bring <laughs> one. So at best, I'll get my hair out of my eyes, but I don't care what I look like. Okay, and, the funny, the funny thing is, and the funny thing is, she has a husband sitting here going. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least I get your hair combed some, some of the time. Yeah. Right? I have to do it myself. All right. Uh, so. um, did we answer all the questions in the chat before we go on yeah. to the next segment? Um, yeah, I think we did. Oh, so, uh, why were there so few Neanderthals? They had such a long time to develop a population. Um, I, think the, I think the, the question is not why there were so few ne Neanderthals, but why there were so many of us. Um, uh -huh. Basically, as, as a top predator we, who Neanderthals were, uh, they had perfectly respectable population. Uh, the, the question really is why we were so weird. Is, um, and oh, is it, we're sorry, very go good at overcoming the checks and balances of nature, are we not? I know that happened with agriculture um, when the climate warmed, but we were, we're very good at overcoming nature's checks and balances. That's all I can say. Yeah. Yeah. For my contribution there, to that answer. There is, there is, I have to point out, there, there's a, a raging contention and issues over the issue we've really dichotomized it. They were just like us and pure fate, pure chance. If we, if we replayed evolutionary history a thousand times, 500 times Neanderthals would be here having this discussion and we'd be extinct. Mm -hmm. And the other side is, 
but it, but it has been demonized, and that's the side Tom and I are on, is they were different. And what they do to demonize it is they say, oh, you're saying there were differences. So that means Homo sapiens was superior. No, we're saying some tiny little cognitive difference may have played a significant role in us surviving and them going extinct. Yeah, so, that right there. So here's how they explain. Here's how they explain it. They say they had smaller numbers because they liked smaller numbers. And uh, what, okay. what we're going to do is argue, you'll see mm -hmm. through my slides, it will argue that no, it was a consequence of brain shape differences mm -hmm. and brain function differences that, that restricted their numbers to 10 to 20. Uh, and we didn't have those same limitations. There were also bottlenecks, though, for the human population that they say, you know, we were reduced to 10,000 um, members uh, at one point, and then we flourished again. So, I mean, it, it, it was a difficult life, but it, right? An ice age, not easy to survive in. Hmm. Yep. So we'll so, follow up on this, and I want to this yeah. idea, the, 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 the demise uh, and those cognitive differences. And uh, I'm just wondering, is there anything at all that we can learn from that as, as we go forward uh, in humanity and our, the challenges that we have? Can we learn from their demise? Population is not one of our challenges. Yeah. Unless it's too much. Yeah. Well, yeah. Over, yeah. yeah. But I mean, well, let's, let's give this picture that 77,000 years ago, likely due to the Toba volcano explosion, no matter what species or number or types of humans all over Earth, everyone now can trace their DNA to that 2,000 reproductive humans in a group of 10,000. So think about this, the possibility that genes sometimes are deleterious. They'll take a fetus right out of the gene pool and the woman has a miscarriage. Some are born with deleterious genes and like cystic fibrosis, they'll have a shorter lifespan. But we also have beneficent genes. So imagine back then, if a child's born with this beneficent gene and they can, their executive uh, functions are enhanced, they can think better, clear better. Everybody related to them is gonna survive. They're gonna have a reproductive fitness advantage. And that special mm -hmm. gene, that magnificent beneficent gene could spread through the gene pool easier if it was only 2000 people all related to one another, you know, wow. ultimately related to everybody on earth. Now imagine today, if we had a kid born, uh, to use Cat Stevens' old name, uh, with a moon and star on his forehead, and he was very, very special, super special. How long would that take that super special gene, whatever it was cognitively, to spread through eight or seven billion humans? Right. So it had to take the human bottleneck plus a beneficent genetic mutation event. I see. With a bottleneck, there's the advantage. Mm -hmm. mm. Well, it's Go the on. same thing about why you don't want to use antibiotics or uh, to kill a population of uh, bacteria because you're wiping out everything but the really resistant ones, and then they can just take over, right? You clean the landscape of their competition, and now they're there to flourish, that same principle you're saying applying to a human population. I'd never put that together. Mm. That is interesting. That makes sense. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, yeah. let's 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 go ahead and visit Fred's so part the of the vagaries present. of chance were in there as well. Yeah. So interesting. So Tony, probably Neanderthals avoided modern humans. Ah, okay. They probably not want to interact with them. Mm-hmm. Good answer. You know, and even and imagine if those that group of 10 to 20 is they had an anathema to larger groups, you know, that they really preferred smaller groups. So now they see this huge group of humans. They're much more likely because they're different mm -hmm. that we just simply avoid them. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Anatols would have avoided us. Yeah. All right. So we have the slideshow back up. Okay. okay what, what I think I'll do is I'll, I'll jump ahead so, so Fred can start. And I'll just summarize what my presentation said okay. is that Neanderthals were a variety of archaic Homo sapiens that lived in Europe and Western Asia between 600,000 and 40,000 years ago. They were very successful hunters and gatherers who adapted to a variety of habitats, including the harsh, dry, cold habitats of glacial Europe. They occasionally interbred with modern Homo sapiens and contributed some genes to the modern genome. 
They disappeared as a distinct population by 30,000 years ago. But we know more about Neanderthals than we know about any other non-modern prehistoric <laughs> group. So they're in a position to give us a perspective on ourselves. And I will pass this on to Fred and let him continue. Let me know when I want to change slides, Fred. Okay. So um, this is a, a talk I've given before about, I made up the word Neanderthalogy, the study of Neanderthalogy. But <laughs> I realized that it really, you know, psychologists, of course, it's the last thing they'd ever do, but it, it touches on so many fields and disciplines of psychology. Okay, you can switch. So the biggest brain we've ever found, it was a Neanderthal with over 1700 cc's and we're about 1300 cc's, maybe 1350 for men and a little bit smaller brains for women. Since there's no IQ differences between men and women, then when we get commonly asked, oh, the bigger brains mean you're smarter, uh, no. That's the strongest piece of evidence that 100 cc differences doesn't matter in modern men and women in terms of their intelligence. This modern brain shape, they are able to say genetically that there were genes that came online uh, in one branch of genes called the microcephalin genes. And one in that family of genes, it, the family regulates brain growth. And we do know there's evidence that um, that gene swept through modern homo sapiens in the last 100,000 years. Um, we, so now what we'll do is we'll do brain shape differences. Okay, <clears throat> so what they used to do is turn the skull over and the foramen magnum is where the, uh, the hole in the skull where your uh, spinal cord would come up into. They turn it over and they fill it with beads Then they until it's full. Then they take the beads and put it in a beaker and then they say, ah, 1500 cc's, ah, 1700 cc's, oh, 950 cc's for Homo erectus. But when they got more sophisticated, what they do is how many straight lines could we draw inside the skull? So, oh, that's a good picture, Tom. And, and you can see um, the number of straight lines inside a skull is infinite. But what happens is if you take a vector of all those uh, lines, and that is a vector is going to describe various parameters or shape, then you get a line or a vector that describes the length of the skull, the height of the skull, the width of the skull. And what we can tell from that with statistics from this factor analysis is what we had in modern humans was a sm slightly smaller brain, rounder, less long and flat, and increase in the parietal lobes. Mm. And um, so that's how we know that paleoneurologists tell us the brains were shaped differently. Can we go to the next slide? Okay, so with this parietal lobe area, and this has only been identified since about 2004 with Emiliano Bruner's work, that what do our modern parietal lobes do? And it's kind of interesting. One thing it is, do you see the precuneus? The precuneus is sort of in the medial middle portion of the brain. When you, when you ask somebody in an fMRI, a modern person, uh, think about yourself, the parietal lobe lights up. When you say, think about others, the parietal lobe lights up. So this expansion in that area, we know is critical. First of all, it sits right on top of where we comprehend speech, the yeah. superior part of the temporal lobes, the upper part of the temporal lobes. And that one intraparietal sulcus right there is known for lots of different modern human functions. We share that intraparietal sulcus, that length, we share it with chimps, but ours is vastly expanded, including a vast expansion or a much larger expansion of the parietal lobes. But what that also means is our sense of self in the parietal lobes was displaced also into this speech area where we would comprehend uh, speech of others and we'd have our own internal speech. So imagine the interaction between the precuneus, the upper parietal lobes with a sense of self and perceptions of the environment. You can take your own perception of the environment, which we'll call egocentric, and then you can take, you can imagine how Tom is looking at me or Paul and Laura looking at me. 
I can tell I can I can picture how you do it. That's allocentric. Parietal lobes does that. And that's the place that expanded. So maybe we're, we're saying one possibility is that Neanderthals with the less expanded parietal lobes, they had a sense of self, no doubt. But maybe they weren't as facile at making allocentric views. Now, allocentric views would be really important for trading. If you wanted to get some special rock from that group and you couldn't possibly speak the same language, but you could negotiate diplomatically because you can figure out or estimate what they're thinking when you make certain gestures. So maybe even we can attribute the ability to negotiate diplomatically to these areas in specific areas of the brain, the parietal lobes. Hmm. Okay, next, oh, Laura? Oh, I was just gonna say that makes sense, wow. So this is the best we can do with those endocasts. And this is my point about straight lines, how many straight lines you can make. But what you're gonna do is when you do a vector, it's gonna be com a combination that predicts all those straight lines. And what we find is we had that, that differentiation. Oh, I wanted to point this picture out before. Do you see the Neanderthal down there using their teeth? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is called the third hand hypothesis. Virtually all Neanderthals show striations on their teeth as if they use their teeth in their daily activities. Now, you know how important teeth are, you know, and none of us were going back to the dentist 100,000 years ago. So we had primitive teeth care. But not all Homo sapiens teeth at the same time show the same striations. So it's almost as if the idea is that it's called the third hand hypothesis is they needed their teeth for a third hand. And I can always hear my mother in my brain yelling at me, don't use your teeth, mm -hmm. don't use your teeth. Yeah. Because they're, they're important for digestion, mm -hmm. you know, for proper metabolism. So here Neanderthals were using their teeth, which just gave them another tiny bit of vulnerability because you use your teeth, you pull them out and you need them. There's no replacing them. In so maybe of, we had better tools and we had more community to do these tasks that needed multiple hands, right? Laura, maybe it was, we outfought the problem. We were able to solve the same, with the same technical tools. Mm -hmm. Now I buy that maybe we might've had more sophisticated ones, but let's assume, no, they were pretty sophisticated tools. We had sophisticated tools, although we obviously made tools that were out of uh, different kinds of material. Clearly, we were more inventive when it came to that kind of technology. But let's say they could solve it with the same technology. We were able to solve it saying, how do I do this without using my teeth? Mm -hmm. And they didn't. Yeah. So the parietal lobes are expanding. Even the sense of numbers, that's numerosity, a sense of oneness, twoness, and threeness is attributed to the parietal lobes, sense of self. Oh, when we replay a memory in our brain of a scene, that's an episodic memory. Do foxes and, and jays, the bird, they cache food and they come back to it. It's an argument that they had episodic memory. They can recall the memory, but what might've been different for us is that we had autobiographical memory. We could see ourselves in the memory. Ah, uh, okay. Did they differ? Uh, I, I don't know if we'll ever know completely, but those are all the modern uh, functions that have been attributed to parietal lobes. And remember the parietal lobes are expanding not only superiorly towards the top of the brain, but they're being displaced right into the temporal lobes where we have language processing, where we have inner speech. The cerebellum is that little brain beneath the big brain. And interesting, the Latin, you could translate it as lesser brain. It's interesting that they've estimated about 84 million neurons are in the whole brain, including the cerebellum. But guess what? 64 billion are in the cerebellum, in this lesser brain. The cerebellum has more neurons than the whole rest of the brain by a factor of four. We do know now that cerebellum was really good at tweaking fine motor movements. And when we used to test that in the hospital, 
when I did it as a neuropsychologist, you'd say, okay, just touch your fingers just lightly. Cerebellum is doing that work. It's a fine motor movement just to touch them lightly. But with cerebellar damage, you'll get this. Bad rate of performance, improper rate, wrong rhythm, they can't line it up. So we do know now that the cerebellum tweaks thoughts just like it does motor movement. Interesting. So, uh, an idea for doing something, let's say a template, a mental idea for doing something, is quickly sent to the cerebellum. And the cerebellum sends it quickly back and it gets tweaked and fine. Now imagine if when we're, I don't know, like driving to, to school or work or something like that, we could do it on automatic pilot. We don't have a lot of consciousness about which turns to make or anything, right? But your mind is free to wander and your mind is free to wonder. So with a more efficient cerebellum, both for thoughts and motor movements, maybe we were better at um, creativity and doing all those uh, archeological things that are more sophisticated mm -hmm. because of a larger cerebellum. Clearly we had a larger cerebellum. We've known it for about 15 years. Wow. Now this group that says they were just like us, it was pure fate, they went extinct. They will never address the larger parietal lobes. They'll never address the larger expansion and temporal lobes. They will never address a larger cerebellum. Or we had bigger olfactory bulbs. They will never address it. No, they were just like us. And, and the reason they can hold that um, attitude so strongly is they'll ignore all brain differences and any implication of brain function, which I think is dangerous. Of course, I'm biased. I spent two years after my doctorate on a clinical neuropsychology postdoc, evaluating brain function, head injury, various areas of the brain. Mm -hmm. Now, the olfactory bulb difference is not inconsequential because the suspicion of the people that first, uh, Marcus Bastier, a paleoneurologist in Europe, said maybe it had, they had a better, we had a better sense of smell. And it's interesting that smell, you know, doesn't, people aren't finding, you know, ever smells being important, except when you get COVID and you become anosmic, you lose your sense of smell. And it happened to me two months ago. I went to the refrigerator. I said, oh, is this salami bad? I looked at it, didn't look bad. I listened to it. I didn't hear any botulism. I touched it and it didn't seem bad, but that's not the way we test things. In the refrigerator, we go, we smell it. And I realized I couldn't smell it. I could get poisoned. I had to throw it out. So I, I hear this from um, people work in the fire department and the military. Burning flesh doesn't smell good. Mm -hmm. Universally, people say burning flesh doesn't smell good. So imagine if you're a, a Neanderthal with a penchant for cannibalism and your penchant for cannibalism means you're going to probably treat the bones of humans, other Neanderthals more likely, just like you treat animal bones and you cook them the same way. You might not be offended by the smell. Hmm. That could also, Tony, on your germ hypothesis is one way we detect germs is through smell. With a lesser discrimination for that, that would make them more susceptible, perhaps, to bacteria. Well, they also say that human populations that practice cannibalism are are susceptible to Jakob Kreutzfeldt disease, right? The prion. That's not not yeah. a healthy thing for this. Yeah, it's well known in Indonesia called kuru from yeah. eating brains, and that these prions mm -hmm. may survive in brains. So it's a little bit dangerous. And contaminate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So. So, so imagine if, and this is what happened, before we entered Europe, modern humans, 45,000 years ago, dominated by Neanderthals all over Europe and Asia, right? We enter, and within 10,000 years, they go extinct without a lot of evidence that we killed them directly, mm -hmm. okay? They couldn't compete. They couldn't extract the same resources. And here's how they managed to survive, perhaps. Only groups of Neanderthals. If you ate a nearby group, it gave you a sense of food, okay? 
and it reduced competition. Okay. So it was a practice when there's small groups that worked really well. You got big game, humans, and you ate this other group that was eating other animals, you reduce competition. So that pension for, for cannibalism may have been partially a function of their olfactory bulbs, less fine discrimination of smell, and you get a food source. Now a new group comes in, homo sapiens, finer sense of smell. You know, they, you know, more than likely they did say, hey, do something with your hair and you're a little stinky. I mean, that's a possibility, right? But, but they you're not going to let me whip that wind down, are you? Uh, yeah. They come in and they, they come in and they don't have, they, they can extract more resources by thinking, by planning, by organizing. And the Anatols were eating one another. And we didn't, we didn't rely on that. We weren't real fans, apparently, even though there are groups of 100 of us. Well, wasn't there a group of Neanderthals that were found that had a lot of genetic deformities, which would imply that they weren't practicing a lot of marriage amongst themselves um, to to create more genetic diversity? Interbreeding. Right. So they were overbred. At least some some group of them were found. Right. That's the the general picture we we get for most Neanderthals is that there's a lot of inbreeding. Yeah, that's and not a lot of travel. Not, not the same great distance as we traveled. Yeah. Okay, so we can move on. Do you want to do this one or skip past him? No, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. Go back, Tom. I was going to say, could you address it that about the molars oh. erupting and, the, and maybe they had a, no, a shorter childhood and adolescence. Actually, you're better at that than me, so go for it. Okay, so this is that notion of a faster speed of life. Um, it looks like 80% of Neanderthals died before the age of 40. That might not have been that different for Homo sapiens 100,000 years ago. It might have still been a tough life, but it looks like their molars did come out faster, which really does suggest they matured faster. They were hairy and, and reproductive faster than we were, perhaps. And so that meant they didn't have that same time of learning in childhood and adolescence where we learn so much and work with our peers. It was a harder life. There's only 10 to 20 of us. And you had to count on these juveniles, perhaps, for work. Uh, so that's a potential consequence for adult lives because adult lives will be less rich and you can pass on less. I do find it fascinating. They called the one of those first skeletons the old man of La Chapelle, and they think he lost most of his teeth, had arthritis, degenerative bone disease, and died at the age of 35 or at most 40 years old. And it looked like an old man's skull. So that just supports the notion of uh, Laura. Tony, I take it back. They weren't hairier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to defend that one. So. This one group that says they were just like us, they just liked smaller groups. No, I don't think so. It had to be a function of some cognitive process. And that is Homo sapiens, uh, this fascinating fellow in, um, in England, Robin Dunbar. You know, he looked at Christmas lists when people used to send Christmas cards and their group was between 100 and 150 cards. If you spent the time in your, so it, it's his evidence that clearly, and no archeologists or anthropologists disagree, we had larger group members, but maybe that's because it's very important to know who's cheating and who's not cheating in a group. Who's pulling their weight, not just sexually, but who's pulling their weight, who's not. And that's why faces are so different with people because it was critically important in our evolution to be able to tell your face and memorize, oh, you're a person who pulls your weight. Oh, you're a cheater. Maybe Neanderthals couldn't keep track of any more than 40 people. Hmm. So maybe that's why the large group differences is we could keep better track of our allies and enemies. I and see. maybe that's where their xenophobia comes from. So we can make inferences about their social life. If you only have 10 to five to 10 or mostly 20 to 40 uh, group, um, maybe the larger groups only got together because they share meat possibility. And here's another social reality is that um, 
the family had to do all their foraging together. The whole group went on the hunt. And uh, did we have that cartoon, Tom, where the, is that in part of our? I think, I think it's somewhere. It's down our, the road somewhere. We don't have to jump to it, but anyway, we'll, we'll have a little cartoon that kind of explains why the whole group might have gone on the hunt. Okay, next slide. I, I, was, I just threw in some examples of, of Neanderthal sites. This, this is one of the best known. It's the site of Lazare in uh, southern France. And if you look at the, these are meter squares. And this is fairly typical for a Neanderthal site. That is, it looks like maybe five to 10 people, 10 would be sort of crammed in there a little bit. And that's fairly typical. So there are, so it's not just the genetics, but the archeological evidence itself points to relatively small residential groups. And there are relatively few of them on the landscape. This is the site of Moldova uh, in, in, actually I think it's in Ukraine, oh my goodness. Um, but, um, and you can see the, the remains of what appear to be huts, but they're still relatively small. And the, the group here again, maybe 20 in, individuals, if the huts were occupied at the same time. And the other thing we know is that they didn't really move much outside of river valleys. This is a study of raw material movement in a river valley in France. And the Neanderthals were using local sources and moving to um, moving back and forth between the source and their sites, but they weren't very often going outside of river valleys. So they really had a sort of small scale existence compared to modern humans. Uh, and this decided Albert Romani in, in, in Spain. And the only point I wanted to make about this are the hearths. These are fireplaces, but they're all very small. And this is very typical of Neanderthal hearths. They're not big Boy Scout hearths. They're little hearths that seem to be for an individual. They're not much bigger than that. And you can see there are a lot of them scattered about in this, in this site. Um, but there's no large central hearth. In fact, there are almost no examples of Neanderthals using large central fires. So they were using fires, they were using fires to cook, they were using fires to keep warm, but they almost certainly were not sitting around fires and chatting. And I think that's a very interesting aspect of Neanderthal lives because all modern humans do that. They sit around fires and they chat and they lie and they tell stories and they do all, <laughs> all the things that modern humans do. And Neanderthals just don't seem to have been doing that. Well, is that representation of lots of individuals at the same time or different times? So they're kind of solitary or they're off in their own little well, fire? That's you would really, think really that... a, tough, a tough call, Laura. And um, well, you would think our archeological just... techniques are really not good enough to yeah. sort of figure out seasonality. And but you would think that it looks as if the, the cave was uh, was occupied sequentially by many people, but how yeah. how many at one time? It's really hard to determine. But you would think that if there was a fire established, a hearth established, you'd go and use that hearth, right? You would think that using resources wisely, everybody would put their wood together, and there would be that's what we would do for all of you. That so that doesn't that's seem logical. to be what Neanderthals did. They yeah. had a different view of the whole thing. Gotcha. Um, Okay, Fred, you want to go on from this? Yeah, sure. Let's, let's... Um, Tony asks about uh, Neanderthal DNA in the Paraha. Oh, I wish he hadn't. Well, okay, um, I added Paraha. He said okay. in, in Amazonian groups, isolated Amazonian groups. Okay. Um, first of all, the, the Paraha, or however it, it's pronounced, um, a lot has been said about them. But what you have to remember, is that people have been in South America maybe 15,000 years at most. Um, all of the folks in South America are very closely related. The unusual features of the Piraha are not because they're primitive, but because they got isolated. So it really doesn't tell us very much about evolution. And I'll, I'll just leave it at, at that. Um, so, do you want to move on, Fred? Or sure, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, could you want to do embodied cognition or switch past this? Oh, let's, hey, let's hear switch. about embodied cognition. Yeah, I want to hear. Okay, about Fred, this. you're on. Okay. 
this is the notion in terms of body cognition. It means it, it started with the idea of a, a blind person with a stick and the blind person's in a stick. The brain of the blind person is confined within the confines of the skull, but the mind goes down the stick to the very tip of the stick and senses the curb and a drop. And that picture may be uh, a visualistic but it's still a picture of the environment is created within the parietal lobes. So the mind has leaked out mm -hmm. from the confines of the brain down the stick. And so we do that with all kinds of things. You know, I, I, I found this um, Mayan writing on a stone in the Exuma Islands. And I know Tom says, it's just purely random, but I know the Mayans were there. And then every time tells me, Tom, it's just a silly little stone. It's a pseudo fossil. It's a pseudo artifact. I say, Tom, you just have so little imagination. <laughs> that's true. Anyway, so that's embodied cognition. It is possible that somebody took a stone and made a little statue, right? And now their sense of reproductive fitness, their sense of womanhood, their sense of sex is all passed in within stone. And there's a scaffold in between the two. Because then you show it to somebody else and they get inspired. Symbol. So that's, yeah. that's the basic notion behind embodied cognition. Wow. Wow. Uh, but, I, but I think the, well, we, we should make the, the point that much of the way we communicate on a family level or mm -hmm. a small group level uh, mm -hmm. is not verbally, but it's through body postures yep. and... Um, tones of voice. I mean, I, you, you've all had the experience of walking into a room and knowing that something was wrong before mm -hmm. anybody said a single word to you. Yeah. Um, and this is because we, we gain a lot of information from other people based on their postures, um, their facial expressions, um, what they're doing with their eyes. I mean, this is all communicative. And much of our social interaction on a small scale mm -hmm. uses that. And yeah, Which I think it's why dogs and our pets too. read us so well. I think they're reading that language as well, our, our pets, right? Yes, exactly. They, and we've selected dogs to be able to do that, and they're very good at it. Yeah. Um, and Neanderthals did that too. I mean, I think if you would look at sort of the social interaction of a Neanderthal family, it wouldn't have been dramatically different from the social interaction of, of most modern humans on a familial level. Mm -hmm. um, I think that is something we probably share. Um, but it's other things that we perhaps don't share so much. So. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just thought of too, um, remember I said the parietal lobes, numerosity, there's, there's mm -hmm. neurons in the parietal lobes attuned to the sense of oneness or twoness or even threeness, you know? And here's embodied cognition. Let's look at the difference between just oneness and twoness, and I'm not gonna use any words. Okay, you ready? Mm -hmm. Paul. Paul. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> vast, vast difference between oneness yeah. and twoness. And yeah. all I'm doing is using my fingers. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? That is. I think. Yeah. Keeps us off the streets. Okay. <laughs> well, okay. okay, you're talking about symbols, gestures, symbols. And um, they say that if you bury your dead with flowers or with a certain position or with art, that's highly symbolic. And therefore, now we can make the leap to the sense of an afterlife or the sense of, I mean, where where do you guys come down on that argument that the Neanderthal, because they they had a little bit of art because they were burying their dead that now they had this rich spiritual life. Where are you on that question? You want well, to take that, Fred? Yeah, well, I'll let you take it second. Let's go camping. My brother, Paul, Laura, we'll all go camping. And sure. uh, one of us dies, but we're not religious. We're all atheists, imagine, you know, uh, one of us dies. Will we bury the person? Oh, we have no religious belief, no afterlife. That will we bury the person? Yes. Why? Because predators would be attracted to a dead body, and you don't. Really and want the that. dead bodies stink, and we have a fine sense of smell. Mm -hmm. So we find a Neanderthal group that buried a member. Mm 
Oh, they had a sense of the afterlife. Oh, they knew that the a supernatural God was going to save that member. And we've got to bear. Let's use the simplest explanation first. It's stinky right, and it right. attracts predators. Yeah. Tom? Um, yeah, a couple of things. First, um, we do have some very good examples of Neanderthal burials. So we do know that Neanderthals occasionally did bury the dead. But compared to what humans do, it was quite different. I mean, Neanderthal graves were never very deep. Um, at most, they were, you know, a foot deep, maybe enough to get a body in and covered up uh, and nothing beyond that. And good example is Kabar, Kabar yes, Cave yeah, in, in, in Israel. And there are the remains from one level of probably Neanderthals, um, mostly known from teeth. There's one shallow grave. What were they doing with the other ones? Um, and uh, this is true at a lot of Neanderthal sites. So as you find lots of fragmentary remains, maybe one individual treated with kind of a grave. More often they would be covered with rocks. Mm -hmm. And the, the evidence for grave goods is thin at best. Um, the famous Shanidar flower burials, eh, not really very convincing evidence that they were buried with, with flowers. And that's about it. I see. Um, basically Neanderthals did not chuck stuff down in graves with people. And so it just looks to be a different kind of mortuary treatment than we see with modern humans that followed them. But that's even hard because if you look at differences around the world in terms of mortuary treatment, there are huge ranges of the way people treat dead folks. And um, it's, it's really hard to generalize about that. Is it possible that Neanderthals had some idea of afterlife? I suppose, but the, the mortuary evidence does not itself compel us to that conclusion. Mm -hmm. And there could be mortuary evidence where ritual happens, but it's not leaving much. Like I leave the body on a bier to, to be dissolved by nature or I burn it, right? There's, there's yeah. so much we don't know. No, I mean, if, the, if they buried point. bodies with beer, that's just simply foolish. Um, so, I'm not saying they did. I'm saying mortuary practices in general, we don't always right. see evidence. I'm, I'm, not, I'm being humans. perhaps yeah. jocular yeah. when I shouldn't be. Um, yeah. Mortuary treatment is very, very interesting, and especially comparative around the world. It's just that Neanderthals don't are not very high on the scale of sophisticated okay. mortuary treatments. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I was just saying that you could have a cosmological understanding and yet not leave evidence, right? That, exactly. That's possible too. That's yeah. what I, I had a student in India who finally brought that up. I've been teaching, you know, these courses for 15 years, you know, and said, um, <clears throat> well, maybe... Neanderthal art was different. Maybe they were into performance art. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, yeah. it wouldn't preserve. Mm -hmm. I don't. I don't buy it, but it's, it's certainly a provocative argument that you know yeah. they weren't into painting on the sides of caves. They had other forms of art. But about thirty thousand years ago, they buried two kids head to head in Russia, and they had over ten thousand beads they were buried with, and two ivory spears tapered to the size of the boy and the girl. So the girl was smaller and her ivory spear was smaller. And they didn't hunt with ivory, it's too soft. They were decorative and there were all kinds of decorative little badges and things. They had clothing. There's nothing anywhere near, remotely near mm -hmm. that time 30,000 years ago with Neanderthals. Now remember at that time they were going extinct also. Yeah. So how do you explain that? A combination of factors. One is competition with us. Because they might have been more xenophobic, smaller groups, they just kept moving away wherever Homo sapiens was. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the most recent bones that they found <coughs> time wise was about 30,000 years ago, I think a tooth in Portugal. And I went to that cave where they found the tooth in Portugal. And I had this picture in my mind that. We come in up from Turkey, up from the Middle East, and they keep moving away and uh, moving, and they only could get to Portugal. That was it. And the mm -hmm. last Neanderthal sat in that cave and said, I've got no friends. There's nobody around. And he laid down and died. Very sad. Yeah. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. That's interesting. Let's move on. Yeah. We, we ruined the neighborhood for them. Yeah. 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 I'll be the first. Want to talk about ornaments and theory of mind, Fred? Yeah. 
Why don't you? Because oh, you want me to. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, one of the things that, that's emerged in the last 30 years is evidence for Neanderthal ornaments. And we do have a few, but not very many. And we do have to ask the question, what does a personal ornament mean? Mm -hmm. And one of the ways I like to do this is I say, when, when I was back when I was lecturing, I could look out in an introductory class and my students would, many of them would be elaborately decorated with things hanging out of their faces. Um, if, if, if you ask them, what does it mean? Yeah. What is it a symbol of? They had not a clue what I was talking about. Um, mm -hmm. so, so what were they doing? Gosh. They were doing it because their friends were doing it. That mm -hmm. is, they were decorating themselves because their friends decorated themselves. And it, it's an expression of solidarity with someone else. Now, does that qualify as symbolism? Not necessarily. I mean, in a narrow definition of symbolism, it doesn't. Um, uh, does it suggest that we're using objects in some kind of signaling way? Yeah, it does. Yes. Yeah. So, um, so, but yeah, does that mean that Neanderthals had language? Mm -hmm. And the answer is not necessarily. It just means they had ornaments and not very many. Okay. Hmm. And this idea of theory of mind actually came out of uh, working with autistic people is um, theory of mind. It's awkwardly named, but it, but it means that you're able to read the attitudes, feelings, and intentions of others, especially in terms of if I say this, how will you react? Maybe I should say it this way instead of that way. But there's, there's levels of theory of mind. And the simplest one is shared attention. So we'll see it developmentally and hierarchically is shared attention is gonna be the basic theory of mind. And I, you can, uh, you'll see little kids, you know, or, or teaching little children, you go, oh, look at this. And, they, and you share that attention. My dog's not so good at it, unless it's a piece of baloney, you know? So we got some, and I'll say the squirrel, the squirrel, like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. You know, so th there's levels of theory of mind. And, and the more sophisticated is, can I, properly, accurately read what your attitudes, thoughts, and feelings are as we interact. So and it, more importantly than that, actually, it's our ability to predict what another individual can predict about us. Mm -hmm. um, and okay. basically, that's, that's the basis of effective teaching, if you think about it, is it's the teacher's ability to imagine what a student is thinking about what the teacher, him or herself, is saying. Um, and uh, so the, the question of theory of mind is an interesting one from an evolutionary point of view. We, we suspect that Neanderthals had basic theory of mind. We suspect Neanderthals were perfectly capable of imagining what an, another individual could see or imagine about you. But the reconstructing what the other individuals thought about what you thought about that individual, that might not have been something they were very good at. And it's something humans are very good at because we use it to cheat people all the time. Um, so and, and tell stories and create mythologies and right and gossip narratives and gossip and, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah all right interesting so we're we're, well, we're actually to put spin on things time right? here so okay so um, Laura what do you want us to hold up and just a answer a few more questions finally or we do can you have do you have a couple more slides are you done. No, we had, we had a whole bunch more slides. Oh, <laughs> we, can you come back for part we, two? We, we, we get can into this pretty... Can you come back for part two? Yeah. yeah, we, yeah. We, so, this is fascinating. Yeah, I mean, we're learning two. so much about yeah. ourselves, right? And you're making such a compelling argument for our mm. own development and what makes us different you know, in yeah. ways that it's just, yeah. And even in preparation for today's discussion and looking at all the different scientific journals, reading up a little bit in yeah. terms of what's out there in the media, trying to understand where this all fits and how that connects to us in this current world that we live in. Um, and like you, you've already mentioned, the, the, the degree of differences between what 
quote unquote experts say is, is quite vast. And so it was interesting today to have that opportunity to go deep into, into the, well, just to the understanding. To see the larger framework. The larger it, framework, yeah. Right? We read reports, Neanderthals are popular. You read reports and then they make these huge leaps of conjecture and, and you guys are dispelling, you two are dispelling this and saying- but I, I hate to say this about my, my compatriots, but careful thinking is not a, a common feature of discussions about Neanderthals. It's, yeah. it's largely emotionally driven, even with professionals. Um, well, and, yeah. and I think that you've spent both a, a career looking deeply at this and creating this uh, developed picture. And, and most of us don't have that opportunity. I think that something so. else takes... happens, which is, which may be a little more troubling, is that interpretations of Neanderthals track changes in the social political world. Thank um, you. I mean, yeah. it, it, in my career, um, I mean, when I was an undergraduate, Neanderthals were considered to be indistinguishable from modern humans. I was back in the in the 1960s. Nobody even thought about it, wow. and then they. Then people started to think of about them again as being separate species for some reason, and then the pendulum swings back, and people and it. If you look at it, it really has a lot to do with sort of social political world, almost like you know who's in power politically. Mm -hmm. um, that, believe it or not, has has an important effect on how people look at Neanderthals. They're <laughs> like doppelgangers. I mean, they, you know, we we you know Makes we sense. use them for almost nefarious purposes sometimes. And it's the, the idea that you can sit down and sort of carefully think through the evidence and use our knowledge of you know, modern brains and modern cognition to try to understand how Neanderthals might be different. Um, Fred and I have had a hell of a time getting people to do that over the last 20 years. Uh, well, I think you're succeeding beautifully because you're making such a compelling um, argument for it. And it's almost as though they're a mirror and we're going to project onto that mirror what we want right. to know about ourselves or think about ourselves or justify about ourselves. Right. And so, um, but well, I appreciate that you're going back to the evidence and you're not letting it read out more than it's actually saying. Um, that's important. What do you hope to find in the future? What do you think you had mentioned advanced technological and uh, uh, various techniques to decode this information that we're going to find more of it and we'll have better methods? What do you think we'll find? I, I suspect we'll, we'll push back archaic DNA um, deeper into the past. I don't think the picture is going to become a lot clearer. Um, we might identify some more relatively distinct groups but you can't really learn a lot about behavior from the DNA. You can learn a little bit, but not very much. And I mean, there seems to be this trend in paleoanthropology that everybody's running to DNA, but we still need the evidence of the fossils. We need the archeological evidence. We need all of the evidence. It's a tough job to try to reconstruct what folks were doing 100,000 years ago. And we can't dismiss any kind of evidence out of hand. We really have to take everything we can do and try to piece it together into an interesting story. And the story is much clearer than it was 50 years ago. Um, so I suspect 50 years from now, we'll know a lot more. Right. How many collaborators are uh, anthropology, archaeology, and psychology? Are you unique in that collabor collaboration? Um, as Two who work continuously together for 20 years were pretty unique, I think. I, I can't think that. of another yeah. pair. Fred, can you? I can't think of. No, it, it, it's hard to get anthropologists to even talk to a psychologist. I mean, yeah. they've got BO. I mean, you know, it's really tough. So. <laughs> but Ian Davidson right. researched us with a, a neuropsychologist and an archaeologist back in 1990. Right. Um, you have a good argument for this um, cross pollination of disciplines. Um, yeah, I remember it's, when it's I got really great. So. When I got first excited about this, that first idea of walking into Tom's office 22 years ago, <laughs> and I said, This is so cool. You know, you're going to provide the archaeological evidence. <clears throat> what do you call this? And he said, Cognitive archaeology. <laughs> and I said, Cool. And he goes, Immediately, don't get too excited. There's only six of us in the world. <laughs> so it, it was it was a bit in its infancy, and then sure. within five or six years, 
Tom came to class. We're co-teaching a course in human evolution and the rise of Homo sapiens. And he was almost choked up. He had the, um, what's that fancy academic newspaper, higher chronicles um, of higher education? Chronicle of higher education, yeah. And they were advertising in there. And they were advertising for a cognitive archaeologist. Mm. And it was sort of like, ah, this science that I've been heralding and, and, and promoting, it's made the big time. They're actually interested in how we can squeeze minds and thinking from archaeological evidence, from stone tools. Interesting. So I also want to ask, what evidence would you like to have? What's missing among the research? Because we're just not there yet. What do you hope is oh, going to be on the horizon? Uh, um, I would like 50 well-excavated, well-reported sites um, and from the entire range of um, when modern humans showed up in Europe to when <laughs> Neanderthals disappeared. Uh, basically, I would just like to see more high quality archaeological evidence. Um, mm. Because when, when you look at the archaeological record, we've got a lot of mediocre evidence, but the high qualities with you know, modern techniques for data recovery, um, they're just relatively few sites that, that have been excavated that way. And they're, they're concentrated in a few places, like Israel, for example, has a wonderful archaeological tradition. And they're you know, the cutting edge in, in terms of archaeological recovery, uh, reporting, and they're theoretically strong, but they're sort of isolated, you know, mm. and um, that's, that's a problem. Um, so I guess in being a good archaeologist, I would say what we need is more high quality archaeology. Um, I would like but, just one site, Laura, mm -hmm. in maybe Central Europe, Central Asia, and they invite me on the dig, and I find a bone that looks a little bit different, and it's that missing hominin. I find the missing hominin bone, and then the name of the hominin will be Homo fredensis. <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> yeah. That's a, yeah. I know it's a classy name, but still. <laughs> we can dream. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Wow. Well, <laughs> well, this is exciting because and, uh, we truly believe that. I mean, our whole mission has been about who are we? Where did we come from? Where are we going? What's it all about? Yeah. And this is such a key body of data to add to that whole. We've looked at every context of those questions. That's true. And yeah. this is such a key one and such an exciting one with so much, um, yeah, breakthrough information. So thank you for being at the forefront of yeah. this and for presenting it to us today. Thanks Hope we get part two. So we'll, we'll um, sign you up for part back. two. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Congratulations on such a, a long and productive uh, body of work uh, individually and, and together. And um, keep us posted of the new developments. Well, keep, keep your eyes open. The second edition of How to Think Like a Neanderthal will be out in a couple of years. So perfect. Oh, you're perfect. at work on it now. Thank, yeah. yep. thank you. Yeah. Thank you both so much. See you next Sunday again, hopefully. Live long and prosper. Yeah, Bye. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> what was that? Yeah, like that. Thank yeah. you for such a lively presentation. Yeah, there it is. So. They're so entertaining. All right, <laughs> so. yeah, that worked out great. Yeah. All right, blessings, be happy. Talk to you later. Bye. <laughs> yeah.